I've been using this machine a lot lately. So much it's just been going from job to job without ever seeing any service other than getting fuel and grease. And it's got a few little issues that I've been ignoring for a while. So uh, I'm supposed to be moving it to a job right now, but I really want to get some work done on it before I bring it there. So the few issues are the, the temperature light's been on all the time now. It's not overheating, but it's, it's annoying. Um, the fuel gauge isn't working right. It works a little bit, but when it's got a full tank, the gauge is reading half tank. And it's it, it does go down, but it, let me see if I can fix that. And I just want to do a few other little things to it. Okay, so the fuel gauge is pretty simple. Um, so the, the ignition on, here's the sending unit right here, which tells the gauge how much fuel is in it. So with it on hooked, it's going down to zero. And with this grounded out, it should go all the way to full. Huh. This whole piece of metal here doesn't seem like it's grounded. Alright, because I see when I ground that to a, one of these screws here, the gauge starts to move. So. All right, so that's interesting. This entire panel didn't have ground. And it definitely should be because it's metal and it's part of the frame. You know, that may have been causing both of my issues. Let's, uh, let's see how high the fuel gauge gets. It should go to full. Yeah, that's going to full. All right, that gauge is good. I bet you that's it. All right, let me see if the, the temperature light's on. Yeah, temperature light's still on. This is just a regular test light here, and I have it hooked to the positive terminal on the battery. So this tests for ground now. So when I touch to a gr you know anything grounded, it lights up. So so we have ground to this right here, but here's some pretty clean metal right here. No ground to this entire piece. So let me uh loosen up some of these bolts and grind just clean so it's so this piece gets grounded all right so now I got this panel off so I can actually work on it I'll plug it back in This is the temperature sensor on the engine. When the engine gets above what is safe operating temperature, this pull, this thing pretty much grounds, this thing here. So with this unplugged, that temperature light should not be on. All right, so turn on the key. I guess it, it let me start it up, but that shouldn't matter because right now, I mean, these should be working. No oil pressure and volts because it's not charging, but. All right, so yeah, so the temperature light is still on there, even with that unplugged. All right, so I actually have the uh, service manual for this thing, which is nice. Uh, it's for a B5, but I think the B50 is close enough. So just the B5 was, was the uh, zero tail swing version of this machine. So we'll, here's the wiring diagram. So let's see, right here, here's our water temperature switch on the engine, and LG, so that is light green, so that's correct, that's what's actually there. So we have one connector, this, is a, this thing here, that means it's a connector. So then we're going across, this dot here means that's connected, so we're going up and down here. Um, we've got a connector, and then lamp checker. I think lamp checker means this is just a open-ended plug, probably one of those plugs you see in there, for servicing this machine, maybe from a dealer or something. I think. So let's check the other direction. So we got here we're back to back to this is from the wire from the engine switch. Go down. Okay, we got LG, we got another connector. We're going down, down, LG, and then here we got water temp lamp. 
let's see, what's YB? All right, so uh, we got LG going into the lamp, and then YB. That's probably ground. Where's that going? Buzzer. And we got, all right, so here's our fuses. All right, so that's that's the power coming in. Is So that makes sense. So the one pole of the water temperature light always has power. And then it gets a ground from this thing once that grounds out. So somewhere along the lines, and here's the, I unplugged this buzzer because it was making me crazy because it was on all the time. BR is brown, let's see. Here's our water temperature sensor on the motor right here. It's got a light green wire. So this, it ties into right here. Up here is pretty much nothing. I think this is just, this is lamp checker. I think this is just one of those opened end plugs which is used for diagnosing electrical issues, I think. Now we go down, LG, LG. So LG just doesn't have any other connections and it just goes straight to the one pole on the water temperature indicator lamp here's the plug for these indicator lights i just unplugged it this pole here here's the light green this should be going to the temperature sensor with no interruptions you know nowhere else it's just going to the temperature sensor and that's unplugged right now so when i this is hooked this is testing for ground right now all right so this test light i have a testing for ground right now so when i ground it out it lights up. So when I touch it to this, all right, so when I touch it to the light green, it lights up. That shouldn't be. This wire must be shorter to ground somewhere and that causing the issue. So I'll inspect the wiring harness for maybe a rub through or something, but it seems like I'll just have to cut this here and then run a new wire from this connection straight to the temperature sensor on the motor and that should fix it. I'm going to cut this wire right here. Now, alright, so I turn this on. Alright, it's on, the ignition's on, We've got no temperature light. Alright, I just ran this wire from the engine. It's the same color as what was there. And I put it in this uh, loom to hopefully prevent it from getting another rub through or something, whatever happened to the other one. I looked for the problem with the original wire. I, I didn't see anything. So so it's easier, you know, rather than spend a ton of time trying to fix that, it's easier just to change the whole wire. All right, so now I can plug this audible alarm back in. And this should be all fixed now. Let's see. So I turn on the key. And uh, we got the alarm because... shouldn't be on right now.
All right, so this is where I'm at with this thing. Um, I have all the lights working like they're supposed to. The warning buzzer, I cannot get to turn off. I'm not sure what they did from the factory. It doesn't make sense to me. So what I'm gonna do is just re-engineer some of the wiring here. So um, in order to make the two lights, they get ground. They, they have The two lights have power all the time. They get a ground signal when there is a problem, either high temperature or low oil pressure. So that means the same thing with the buzzer. So uh, it will have power all the time and then it will get ground from the same thing and buzz. The problem is you can't share the one buzzer. So there's two ways I can make this work. One is to install a diodes to share the ground. So that's what a diode is. It only lets electricity flow one direction. But I think what will be easier is to just install a second warning buzzer. So I'll have one buzzer on one light and one buzzer on the other light. So this will have power all the time. And then this is the ground signal right here. And once the light comes on, the buzzer will come on. So I'm just going to set this up. So ignition on. All right, so yellow. Yellow has power all the time. All right, this should all be fixed now. So let's, uh, let's give it a try. So ignition on, so we have a warning. So let's start it up. All right, cool, no warning lights and no buzzer. So here, I'll simulate a uh, loss of oil pressure. And there we go, low oil pressure. All right, so that's good, that was low oil pressure. And uh, let me start it up. All right, and I'm gonna go simulate overheating. So that's good. Those electrical issues are fixed on this. So there's a few other little things I want to do to it, but it's like change the oil, grease it, clean it, a few other minor, it's just minor stuff, so I'm not going to bother filming it. Um, but people often ask me about wanting to buy heavy equipment and what to buy. So the truth is, I don't really know because I haven't, you know, I only know the machines I have experience with, but I definitely want to talk about this one. This machine I use probably by far the most because it's a very useful size, it's easy to move, and it can do pretty much anything I want to do with it most of the time. I do have a bigger one as well, but um, as far as machines go, th this one, I just, you know, obviously I just did a video fixing it, but this thing breaks so rarely, I can pretty much say it doesn't break. I mean, it's, I bring this machine from job to job to job over and over again, and the thing just works. You know, it's it's really nice because like even like the body on it is nice, strong metal. It's protected. It doesn't get all smashed up. Um, you know, I can talk like I have that big orange Hitachi excavator too. That one, pretty much, if you're running that one six, seven days, you know, if you all right, if you run that one for a week, one of those days in that week you spend fixing it. Pretty, it's pretty much a given. This one, like, you know, you could run this thing for three months and you maybe have one day fixing it within the three months. So I definitely got to say Yanmar does a real good, I mean this one at least, this excavator is awesome as far as being real, as far as how reliable it is. So I can't really say for other brands too. Um, I do want to say I've had a few John Deere machines though in the past and 
every John Deere machine I've ever had has been a piece of garbage. So that's the one company that you see pretty often that I would stay completely away from. You know, the Hitachi is okay. The Komatsu excavator I have is that's very reliable too. That's nice. The Ford tractor I have, or New Holland, whatever you want to call it, that's that's pretty good too. That usually doesn't break. It breaks sometimes, but it does break. But it's usually because I broke it. Because there's a few things on that are delicate that are easy to smash on it. You know, this thing you could do anything you want on this, and you know you're not. It's it doesn't get like the Ford tractor, for example. If running over stuff sometimes, I've had sticks and stuff pop up and break stuff on it, like the steering arm I've broken a few times, and hoses, and the radiator. It's a little frustrating. This thing is all covered in metal panels that are really strong, so you can pretty much drive it anywhere, you know, through a pile of knockdown building or brush or trees, and nothing gets smashed on it. Bobcat skid steers that I have, I'm not that impressed with them for how reliable they are. They are okay, but they are. I mean the one, the 743 I have, I'm often doing hoses on that thing and they're like always hard to get to. So if I was buying another skid steer, I'd maybe look at a cat or a Takahuchi or... Alright, so yeah, this this thing is done. Doing a few other little things to it, but now I'm bringing this right to that, uh, this is going right to that septic job right now.